was so excited when Joy said, hey, this program is happening because uh, pulling together people from different faiths not only brings together great conversation, uh, but this is also a timely conversation. Uh, as we know, in Haiti right now, cholera is spreading among the three million people in Port-au-Prince. If you look in that paper, not only would you see that article, but you'll see a number of pullouts where a number of faith communities are putting forth messages, kind of pushing forward saying, we need your help. Uh, so this is a timely conversation that we're having tonight, and I'm really excited that you come out this evening. I'm really excited that our panelists are here, uh, and I'm glad that the council is, as it always does, creating a space for community members and individuals like ourselves to come together and speak together. Uh, if I can refer to the scriptures uh, in the Old Testament, it's again timely because we're dealing with the Abrahamic faiths here. Uh, Micah says, what is it that your Lord requires of you than to do justice, love mercy, and walk humbly before your God? Uh, so I'm really glad that we're having this conversation, the moral responsibility uh, that we have as individuals and that we have as faith communities towards uh, others in relation to the environment. I'd like to introduce our moderator. Uh, Mr. Carl Rowley. Carl uh, is a former practicing attorney, and another title that he holds is an environmental educator. Uh, he works in an organization uh, called Common Good City Farm, which allows uh, or assists food security for low-income families here in Washington, D.C. Uh, in addition to that work, he is a member of the advisory board of the D.C. Farm to School Network, and he's the former co-president of the D.C. Environmental Education Consortium. So I'm going to turn it over to our more than capable moderator, who will introduce our panel, and we will get the show on the road. Let's give him a hand, Mr. Carl Rollins. To introduce our um, panel this evening, um, we have a very esteemed panel. Um, I'm very excited um, that, that uh, the Humanities Council has put this uh, event together so that we could um, discuss these issues and, and come together um, because, as the World House uh, essay indicated, um, we live in a world, especially after globalism, um, and this is in many ways prophetic, where uh, we can't be separated anymore. And so uh, uh, people of different faiths uh, need to come together um, and to uh, have conversations. And um, there's so much more that unites us than divides us. And, um, and it's all about people coming together. I would like to introduce Josh Tolkien. Uh, he's the advocacy director for Jewish Funds for Justice and um, a founder of the Baltimore Jewish Environmental Network. He advocates for future generations and vulnerable populations threatened by climate change. He has worked to build a coalition of faith and community groups to improve air quality in Maryland and to reduce the impact of global warming that has affected the Chesapeake Bay. Uh, Reed Detchen is currently the Vice President for Energy and Climate at the United Nations Foundation. He seeks to bring about change in U.S. energy policy to address critical challenges related to the production and use of energy, such as the political and economic security threats posed by the world's dependence on oil. Detchen is also the former chair of the Environment Committee of the Episcopal <coughs> Diocese of Washington and states that global warming poses a profound moral challenge to which we must respond. Sarah Jawade is a research associate at the Urban Land Institute and coordinator for DC Green Muslims. She performs research on national transportation, infrastructure, and water supply policy issues and advocates for environmental issues from a faith-based perspective. Well, um, it's a pleasure to be here today to join all of you and share my, from my perspective um, and to focus on uh, what we all have in common and I think holding our differences rather than um, focusing on them. So I'm, I'm looking forward to this conversation, hopefully this dialogue. So thank you for having me. Um, got involved with uh, help create an environment committee at, our, at my church, St. Columbus Episcopal Church in Northwest. Since we mentioned earlier the Abrahamic faith, you know, you look through the Bible and you don't see any injunctions not to recycle or to recycle in, in the Ten Commandments. And you don't, uh, there's nothing about turning off your light switch or driving a Prius. And it's, it's a little bit hard. There, there's not a lot of scriptural support for what we think of as environmental injunctions. But 
at the end of the day, it became the simplest part of every faith, which is the two things we're being asked to do are love God and love our neighbors. And if we love God, are we going to desecrate the gift that he's given to us of this world? That's the um, I was raised in California in a very liberal Jewish household where I probably spent more time volunteering through my religion than actually going to services, um, where the social justice ethic is a really critical part of my upbringing. Um, there's a Jewish phrase, uh, tikkun olam, it means to heal the world. Um, and it's a pretty strong value that was taught to me when I was growing up that we had a responsibility to leave this planet be better than we found it. And really feeling that my environmental values had come from Judaism, when I went on to college, I became active in Hillel to go to services and get a nice Shabbat dinner every Friday, really great dinners. And then I would join the Eco Club to do my environmental activism. And the Eco Club was very secular. Um, I would actually say that at times some of the secular environmental movement even can be almost hostile towards religion. On one hand, there's a place where I deal with my morals and my values and meet with other people and talk about faith, and then I go somewhere else to actually act on it. I'm not saying that attending services isn't acting on it, but I wanted to do something. I wanted to lobby or I wanted to get my school to buy solar panels. And a passion of mine was figuring out how we could take those same values that motivated us and actually use those as a pathway to organize through the Jewish community or through, in many cases, an interfaith community. Let's go back to what Dr. King said in the World House essay. Uh, to quote Dr. King, uh, we have inherited a large house, a great world house, in which we have to live together, black and white, Easterner and Westerner, Gentile and Jew, Catholic and Protestant, Muslim and Hindu, a family unduly separated in ideas, culture, and interest, who, because we can never again live apart, must learn somehow to live with each other in peace. How can a mutual responsibility, and that's the end of the quote, but what I'm asking here tonight of, of, of everyone on the panel, and eventually we'll all hopefully get to weigh in on this, how can a, a mutual responsibility to protect the environment promote peace and understanding among people of diverse ethnic and religious backgrounds? Will protecting the world house lead to coexistence as a world house? So, um, this is a question that I've, I've, I've thought a lot about. I'm pretty early on in my career, and um, I'm still like sort of learning the ropes. I've, I have an urban planning background, and um, I, as I was learning more about my own faith, I was able to connect that there's this huge environmental component to being a Muslim um, and being. Uh, having this sense of responsibility and duty to protect the earth. Um, it's, it's almost like as if it's a, it's a covenant um, that, God, that God has, um, has uh, bestowed upon mankind. Um, but growing up with that sort of thinking, I, um, I guess I wasn't as exposed to different ways of, of being in, in my own family and, and the friends that I associated with. And um, it wasn't actually until this past summer, um, in, in, the, in the past, um, where I went to uh, this retreat for the Center for Whole Communities, which is this organization that brings together people from diverse backgrounds who uh, work on environmental issues. And so this retreat brought together people of every ethnicity, religion, sexual orientation, and the differences were very clear. Um, but what we ended up doing together was um, focused, like holding the differences that we had and, um, and seeing them as points of our own strength. Almost universally, people feel an awe of nature. And that ends up filtering into their religious life. But it's something that we start off with, it's all in common. We've all got to do something about this together because it doesn't matter whether you emit carbon dioxide in Beijing or in uh, Delhi or in Boston, uh, it's all the same carbon dioxide, and we're all going to have to figure out what to do about it together. So I think that neglect of the environment can lead to conflict, and when we're really going to be forced to deal with resource scarcity and water scarcity and the effects of climate change, I think that's going to force us to uh, deal with each other in a, in a constructive way always been interested in like, the design of cities 
and how we can be um, more intentional about creating sustainable cities. Um, and so, I mean, I've worked in um, worked in as a transportation planner, um, trying to think about how we can lessen the trip from our work to our home, um, either um, by building differently or providing more transit options, different types of modes. And so that was what I did during the day. Um, but I wasn't really able to connect um, that, like my day job and what I, you know, what I was passionate about. Um, with my um, religious framework until I met and created relationships with um, mentors who are older than me who have been doing this thinking for years now and I didn't I met them in DC so so really this is really part and parcel of loving your neighbor or, or as it says in another point esteeming others before yourself um, and, and the, these are common themes in, in the Abrahamic faith uh, what kinds of uh, discussions are taking place within your faith communities uh, about going green or combating climate change? Or... Uh, there's also an increased movement around greening congregations. Um, this idea that if we should um, put our money where our values are, so if our congregation is talking about environmental issues, we should you know, look up at the lights or at the windows, or um, a lot of these um, synagogues were built at the turn of the century, some of them, some of them newer, but a lot of them are older drafty, not very energy efficient, so um, there's an increased movement towards greening our own facilities. Um, and that's actually led to a lot of really creative interfaith work, looking at ways we can fund it, because it's really, sometimes it's hard to get the upfront costs, but... Um, it's kind of interesting because um, I began reading all of these articles about climate change, and I had already made the connection or had the feeling that, that I felt called um, uh, by God to not only help my fellow man and, and do all the things that we think about, like maybe helping people, uh, homeless people on the street or, or going out and doing other kinds of service projects, but, but I, I, I felt that, that I was supposed to uh, uh, ultimately you know, take leadership somehow. And uh, I ended up uh, in, in, in this, what I call uh, the food movement, um, uh, because I think there's, there's just a lot of intersections between the um, environmental movement and the local uh, food movement. And uh, I, I kind of think, in a sense, when I'm teaching about nutrition, I'm, I'm teaching about self-control. When I'm teaching about environmental education, I'm, I'm, I'm teaching people to put the greater good before their own personal good. Um, when I'm teaching about the environment and climate change, I, I'm teaching, you know, especially with the young people, um, to be worried about future generations before yourself. And my first year at college, this is what I'm doing in D.C., and I feel like I am fighting the fight by myself when it comes to, like, environmental issues. And I feel like one of the reasons that's happening for me is because I'm working inside a faith organization. I'm a young Jewish professional, whatever that means. Um, and... Working within an already like tight community means that I'm having a hard time pressing these issues to groups that already are fighting their own struggles. Like Jews, especially, have a history of persecution, and and Christians and Muslims, I'm sure, are, it's the same thing. Like we already have so many values that we're dealing with. I'm having a hard time pushing through any agenda that doesn't already correspond to like the problems we're already dealing with. And for me, um, environmental issues. This is a civil rights issue. This is a race and class thing. And it's hard for me to watch communities of faith um, not respond to something that is so similar to the persecution so many of us have already dealt with as a community. So if you have any recommendations for how to push those agendas through um, in communities that are already so focused on issues of social justice but on a different level, um, I would greatly appreciate that. I think it's an interesting question. One thing I don't think we said was that all three of us are affiliated one way or another with a group called Greater Washington Interfaith Power and Light, which is a, uh, and its, uh, its website is the initials gwipl.org. Um, it's a, a, a group of congregations that have come together to uh, reflect uh, protection of the environment in uh, worship or in education. Uh, or in study or in advocacy. In Washington, D.C., in this neighborhood, 
um, it's known as a food desert because there are not that many supermarkets around here. People cannot get healthy, affordable, fresh fruits and vegetables. And so this is, it's been uh, said to be part of the environmental justice movement. Um, we call it community food security or food access, but it's also called food justice or food sovereignty. So the idea, piggybacking on what you said about it kind of like starting from a personal ethical standpoint is what we're basically saying is like, look, our leaders and our business leaders have not provided any supermarkets. So this is like a self-help way to um, solve the problem. And I think, you know, like uh, the only way to really do it is to sit down and have the conversations. And, and so I hear, we, we, we sort of wait for people to solve this for us. Let's get legislation or let's do this or that. But political change starts with personal change. It's not the other way around. Personal change leads to political change. And when people want something, the system will reflect it. And the reason we haven't gotten global warming legislation or, or anything else is because there isn't a popular groundswell for it, right? I mean, there are any number of ways into people's hearts, but you have to hear what they're open to first. And I would just like to thank um, uh, all the panelists uh, and all the uh, members of the audience who sat and listened and who uh, had great comments and great questions. And um, I would just uh, uh, thank you for coming and pray that uh, you would go in peace. And uh, God bless you.